dear friends and my colleagues a very good evening and warm welcome to this is a master class ild it is a very fascinating term for all of us and our fraternity not only because of its rarity but also the enigma which is associated with its etiopathogenesis ild is not a single disease rather it is a conglomeration of more than 200 entities similarly ctild and adild is a major component of it since 1948 the research is going on for the betterment of its diagnosis as well as its management for the better prognosis and if we look at it's a recent guideline which has been changed in this uh, past few years there is a paradigm shift so as far as concern as a pulmonologist it is not much in practice due to multi specialty approach luckily we have one renowned rheumatologist today's for today's master class dr manish dugar he is excellent doctor currently working in apollo hospital hyderabad as a consultant rheumatologist to take on this topic to discuss some practical tips and guidelines for better diagnosis and the management of this combination of this disease so i invite dr manish tukar to please deliver your lecture and wipe some mist and provide some practical guidelines share your experience for the betterment of future treatment of this disease sir i invite you please thank you thank you for the kind words of introduction uh, today i'm going to talk to you about interstitial lung disease especially associated with connective tissue disorder which is quite close to my heart and this is a disease where the expertise of both a pulmonologist and a rheumatologist is needed to take the patient out of trouble so the outline of my talk is to you know show you the importance as to why we need to recognize this disease how this disease can present to you how can we diagnose it confirm it and then think about treating it and what are the other aspects that we need to keep in mind when we treat these diseases any damage which happens to the tissue results in an inflammatory response there is an influx of uh, cells release of cytokines which leads to a consolidation phase and ultimately the healing process happens by fibrosis in all forms of diseases especially autoimmune diseases it is best to intervene in the initial phases when there is lot of reversibility now why are we talking about it even in the best centers which are looking at ctd ild they may be missing these patients the lung manifestations of these uh, you know patients and this diseases are important to recognize because we can offer them early treatment now who is our target patient group especially female gender younger age group of patient and patients who have ground glass or nsip pattern on ild where they are more amenable to treatment and the final point is that this ctd ild is responsive to the immunosuppression treatment that we give them and improves the mortality of the patients and i will be focusing on this at a later time now the pulmonary manifestations of rheumatic diseases especially rheumatoid or scleroderma are many but i am only going to focus on ild now approximately up to 20% of all patients with rheumatoid arthritis may develop ild during their lifespan and most of the time in rheumatoid it's uip pattern ild which is associated with probably more severe lung disease initially at the time of diagnosis ild may be present in a very small percentage of patients ild contributes to death 
contributes to reduced survival in patients with rheumatoid. In terms of ILD in patients with CTD like scleroderma or myositis, it is more common, uh, reaching up to maybe 70%, 80% of patients. And the initial presentation may be because of ILD. In patients with lupus and mixed connective tissue disorder, the lung manifestations of ILD are rare. There is more of serositis or PAH which happens. And here, it's only less than 5% of patients out of all the patients with lupus who may have lung manifestations. Now, even though the involvement of the uh, respiratory system can be anywhere from the airway, especially in vasculitis patients or pleura like in rheumatoid or lupus or vascular, you know, leading to PAH or ILD, I am only going to focus on ILD today. The point I which I want to emphasize is that the extrathoracic and the intrathoracic disease activity may not correlate in these autoimmune diseases. So the patient may present with an ILD with no lung no joint symptoms, or the patient may have a lot of joint symptoms or rashes and not have any lung involvement. So we have to be careful when we look at these patients. Approximately 15% of all patients who have ILD may have an underlying connective tissue disorder. So we need to look for these, uh, in these patients, the manifestation of lung as ILD because it could be the first presentation, especially in patients with myositis. Now, if you look at all the types of ILD, the ones which are highlighted are the ones where there are more chances of progression to fibrosis which means that over a period of time, the FVC, the symptoms, and the fibrosis on the lung CT scan is going to progress. So these are the patients in whom we need to be a little bit more aggressive in our treatment to prevent uh, you know, complications and improve the survival. And in autoimmune diseases, patients with rheumatoid arthritis, scleroderma, top the list. And I will also touch upon interstitial pneumonia with autoimmune features and the benefit of treating these patients with uh, immunosuppression. Now, how can these patients present to you? The symptoms may be dyspnea, maybe cough, maybe weight loss or uh, you know fever. And on examination, you might find some lung signs. Uh, on further evaluation with a CT scan, you may be able to find uh, involvement of the lungs in terms of ILD with NSIP, UIP, or other patterns. Um, this, I will leave it to you as you are the experts. Sometimes the patient might have a known autoimmune disease and in that group of patients, the diagnosis may be easier. In patients who don't have a diagnosed autoimmune disease, we have to look deeper to diagnose them. If a patient presents with a rapidly progressive ILD, within three to six months, they are having uh, you know, high oxygen requirement, more fibrosis, then definitely we need to think about either scleroderma or anti-MDA5 disease, where they have myositis, skin rashes, and rapidly progressive ILD. ILD or pneumonitis can also be because of, uh, you know, a complication of treatment, uh, you know, leflunomide, methotrexate, TNF-alpha inhibitors. And usually these patients do well once the drug is uh, stopped and a short course of steroids is given. Now, when to suspect CTD ILD? especially in the younger age group of patients, less than 50 years of age, if they are from the female gender, and especially if they have any symptoms which point to an autoimmune disease, like joint pains, early morning stiffness, Raynaud's, any rashes, uh, oral ulcers, weight loss, fever, muscle weakness. And in these patients, we have to examine the hands very carefully because most of the signs are found in the hands. So if you look at the nail folds, you look at the PIP joints, digital ulcers, mechanics hands, and I'll show you some pictures uh, after this slide as to how to pick them up. So if you look at this patient who has rheumatoid arthritis, uh, you can see that there is involvement of the proximal interphalangeal joint, synovitis, uh, and there's some synovitis in the wrist joints, uh, flaying of the MCPs with inflammation here. And in patients who've had long-standing rheumatoid arthritis or untreated, we may even find nodules on the PIP, DIP joints. Now, usually in my practice, deforming rheumatoid arthritis is hardly seen in the new patients because we can offer them good treatment. But uh, patients who have been on 
you know, long-term disease, they develop definitely some deformity. So initially, this manifestation of synovitis in the PIP or the MCP joints may be subtle, and there may be only one or two joints which might be important. So definitely ask for early morning stiffness of more than 30 minutes, uh, swelling of these small joints, and stiffness of small joints. Uh, patients with lupus will present with this uh, kind of palatal ulcer, amela rash, vasculitic rashes on the hands, and these kind of rashes which are sparing the DIP and PIP joints and are in between. Now, this is different to the Gottron signs which will be present in the over the joint in the PIP and DIP area. Raynaud's. So, classically, discoloration of the fingertips on exposure to cold and they may become pale like in this patient or they may, come, may become violaceous or pinkish and there is no set pattern to it. Some patients might develop pale fingers like this or some patients might develop uh, you know, violaceous or some patients might develop uh, pinkish uh, fingers. Skiodum. Now in these patients, we have to look for digital ulcers. We have to look for contractures they might have, uh, you know, auto amputation of digits. They might have puffy fingers where the fingers are a little bit swollen and there's discoloration. And the skin, if you can just try to pinch the skin on the back of the hand or the dorsum of the, uh, the hand, it will be difficult to lift the skin up. So uh, once you have, you know, seen these patients, it will be easier to identify. Again, these are signs which are seen in patients who've had long-standing disease. In patients with early disease, you might only see puffy hands like this and thickening of the skin and Raynaud's. Nail fold capillaroscopy, uh, especially in patients with myositis and scleroderma, is a good bedside tool. We can even do it with a, a dermatoscope or an ophthalmoscope. And you can look at the nail folds to see these uh, you know, capillary hemorrhages and dropouts. And this is uh, on magnification with the help of a gadget. But in the clinic, uh, probably just looking at the nail folds with the naked eye or a magnifying glass may give us some clues. Uh, Antisynthetase syndrome, uh, these are the patients who have myositis, they have some arthritis affecting the MCP and uh, P IP joints. They will have uh, mechanics hands where there is fissuring on the index finger, uh, thumb, and if it's uh, quite extensive, it can extend to the entire hand. They may have interstitial lung disease and synovitis, stenosynovitis of the wrist joint. Uh, another antisynthetase syndrome where the anti-PL7 antibody is present, which is seen in this patient where they have stenosynovitis, they have uh, UIP pattern ILD and uh, Raynaud's. You can see the discoloration in the fingertips. Now, in the Indian patients, because of the color of the skin, Occasionally, the mechanic's hand might just present as hyperpigmentation of the palms and soles. There are quite a few patients, if you look closely, might have this discoloration in the hands. And there may not be much fissuring, even though this patient has, but it might be just pigmentation. And this is a variant of mechanic's hands. Another few pictures of mechanic's hands where there's fissuring and some hyperpigmentation. Look at the nail fold infarcts, which are in, present in this patient with dermatomyositis who has a mela rash, has a shawl sign, and these nail fold infarcts, which are visible even to the naked eye. And you can look at these black spots, which are nail fold infarcts. Another patient with Gottron's, uh, no, dermatomyositis, uh, where they have this Gottron sign over the MCPs, uh, heliotope rash around the eyes, again, a little bit of rash on the forehead, on the uh, nasolabial folds and a shawl sign and paniculitis where there is inflammation of the fat cells leading to scarring and a Gottron's uh, papule around the elbow joint. Now anti-MDA5 dermatomyositis ILD, these are patients who have rapidly progressive uh, lung disease, they have extensive involvement, they might have necrotic skin lesions and uh, vasculitic looking uh, quite severe rashes on the hands. And in these patients, we need to be very, very aggressive. And usually they are like the cytokine storm that we are now seeing with COVID-19 patients where they rapidly deteriorate. Uh, and in these patients, we have to be quite aggressive with immunosuppression, including IVIG and uh, high-dose pulse steroids. Um, do not forget uh, sarcoidosis where the patients might present with some nodules around the eyes. They, this patient had dry cough 
and on further evaluation had a biopsy proven um, sarcoid uh, you know granulomas uh, biopsy was taken from the forehead lesion and hyla lymphadenopathy so how do we investigate these patients once we have kind of uh, you know thought about ctd ind so the few common tests that we order rheumatoid factor if it's three times the normal limit and anti nuclear antibody Uh, so it's best to order an immunofluorescence because uh, myositis patients may have a cytoplasmic uh, pattern on the ANA which may be missed by the ELISA uh, anti CCP uh, ANA profile which will look at multiple antibodies and I'll talk it talk about it later myositis profile systemic sclerosis profile and anchor testing uh, usually in microscopic polyangiitis they may have lung manifestations and the new antibodies of anti mda5 and xp2 which is which are seen in dermatomyositis kind of illness and they may have lung involvement so when we order an ana profile we look at 15 antigens and these antigens which i have listed first are the ones associated with lupus so un rmp sm ssa ssb tsdna histones for sjogrens we have ssa ssb uh, mixed connective tissue disorder un rmp a scleroderma where we see a lot of ild scl 17 centromere b which is seen in limited scleroderma so the classical teaching is that limited scleroderma will not affect uh, the lungs but will cause some vascular problem and ph however if you look at all the um, the scleroderma registries there are a small group of patients who have centromere antibody and develop ild myositis antibodies uh, jo1 and pmscl If you look at the anti-synthetase antibodies, the first five antibodies uh, commercial assay is available, and uh, they can be detected. The other varied, uh, you know, other important features of anti-synthetase syndrome is that depending on the antibody present, the various uh, manifestations might be there. So PL7 is associated with dermatomyositis, kind of rash, tenosynovitis, and a uh, you know lower myositis uh, inflam muscle inflammation. So CPK might be lower. while pl12 and uh, ks and oj may have uh, uip pattern ild and usually this ild has poor prognosis steroid resistance and in these patients we need to think about uh, more aggressive treatment now these the next two slides are just to show you the importance of these antibodies so if you look at the likelihood of developing ild in patients who have these anti synthetase antibodies and if you look at the numbers 70% 90% 90% 90% up to 100% so almost universal uh, presence of interstitial lung disease in these patients and in mda5 the chances are around 70% the same antibodies uh, in scleroderma if you look at it close to 60 to 80% of patients and in the other rare variants co unrmp 30 35 so if we find these antibodies on our screening we definitely need to look for an ild if we haven't with the tests that are available to us now diagnostic tools uh, for ild detection apart from autoimmune testing uh, the one that we you must be doing day in and day out is to do the lung function test so when we look at the pulmonary function test if the fvc is less than 75 and the dlco less than 80% that should ring a bell for us to search for an ild uh, and uh, you know further and if this declines in the next 2 years the mortality is more if the fvc decline is more than 10% or 15% decline in dlco again the mortality is more so we need to follow these patients closely and offer them treatment if the disease is worsening in terms of doing a scan to look at the type of ild which is present so hrct is the gold standard and uh, we might see a lot of ground glass opacities suggestive of nsip or fraction bronchiectasis or uh, you know honeycombing suggestive of uip one thumb rule for rheumatologist is that if there is ground glass opacity it is amenable to immunosuppression it is reversible so these are the patients where we focus our attention and give you know targeted immunosuppression uh, there's always a lot of talk about gastroesophageal reflux contributing to lung symptoms so they have looked at uh, you know the esophageal diameter and they found that if the esophageal diameter is more than 18 mm a patient is a male patient more than 50 years with the scleroderma antibody positive then the chances of a severe ild are more 
The other diagnostic tools that we have is a six minute walk test. Some people have utilized a lung ultrasound in a research setting, an MRI to cut down the radiation. And obviously, if we are not able to distinguish between infection and inflammation, we turn to our pulmonology colleagues to do a lavage and take samples for culture. Still, things are not clear. We look at surgical or the new uh, cryo lung biopsy. In the research setting, there are some biomarkers like KL6 levels, CCL18, which can be used and are elevated in patients with ILD. And finally, PET scan. This might help us to target the lung where the biopsy has to be done. So if you look at this paper, which was uh, published last year, they have looked at uh, eight patients with scleroderma ILD uh, and uh, controls where patients with uh, Sjogren's and LSLE. And they looked at the inflammation, which is there in the lungs, uh, as evident here in the scans, and uh, how much this will help us in clinical decision making or treatment uh, remains to be seen uh, because we can't do a PET CT on all our patients uh, because of the cost as well as the risk of radiation. Now, apart from all these patients who are straightforward, have rheumatoid, have MCTD, have scleroderma, there are some patients who don't fit the bill. So here's a lady who's 50 years old, has an NSIP pattern on ILD, and because of this, some tests were done which showed a rheumatoid factor positive, 100, so it's significant, a P anchor which is positive, and uh, she doesn't have synovitis, but she has some joint pains. So in these patients, how do we diagnose, how do we treat? So there is this interstitial pneumonia with autoimmune features, which came about in 2016 from uh, you know, a group of pulmonologists. And uh, we rheumatologists uh, call it as undifferentiated connective tissue disorder or autoimmune flavored ILD, where there is no definite autoimmune disease, but some features are there. So these features can be clinical features, which are mechanics hands, inflammatory arthritis, uh, ulcerations, Raynaud's, rashes of dermatomyositis. Second would be serological, where they have antibodies which are positive, and these have been listed here. And the third is morphological, where the uh, interstitial lung disease is present either on the CT or on the biopsy. Uh, so if, we, if the patient has one feature from each of these domains, clinical domain, serological domain, and morphological domain, we may label these patients as interstitial pneumonia with autoimmune features. Now, there are some drawbacks and some you know, positive things about it. So what are the positive things? Basically, it helps us to classify our patients, give them a diagnosis, and offer them immunomodulatory, immunomodulatory treatment. The lung manifestations may be the first feature. So you know, later on, these patients might develop lupus or scleroderma. Patients who are getting worse may be identified for lung transplant. Now, what are the problems? The problem is that in this uh, classification, anchor serology is not included, and patients with microscopic polyangitis may have ILD. Also, some of the other antibodies, newer antibodies like anti co RNA polymerase, and scleroderma are not included. The second problem is that we are grouping the patients who have good prognosis and bad prognosis together. So a certain patient might just have an ANA, which is positive, a uh, little bit of ILD, joint pains, and obviously is on the good uh, spectrum, good prognosis spectrum. The, on the other hand, the other patient might have SCL70 antibody or MDA5 antibody, uh, you know, and uh, not have the complete picture of scleroderma, and they may have worse prognosis. The third point is that the UIP pattern ILD, which is commonly seen in patients with rheumatoid and scleroderma, is excluded, uh, basically to make sure that we are not taking patients with uh, uh, pulmonary fibros idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis in this. Obviously, we don't have any RCTs. And patients who have reflux or esophageal motility and esophageal dilatation are not, uh, you know, these symptoms are not included. Now, why do we need to treat? So if you look at this, uh, you know, survival graph of 2005, where they looked at uh, CTD, ILD patients, uh, 46 of them, uh, and they looked at the five-year survival, the difference in survival between these uh, CTD, ILD patients and idiopathic interstitial pneumonia patients was no different. The p-value was insignificant. Uh, Ten years later, patients with UIP pattern myositis-associated, uh, you know, uh, interstitial lung disease, the difference in the graph was very, very obvious. So the first line is the patients with uh, myositis-associated UIP-ILD, and they were treated with immunosuppression, 
and the event free survival which is de the death or lung transplant was significantly better than patients with uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis uh, same thing uh, in patients with interstitial pneumonia with autoimmune features so if you see the first green line is the ctd ild the blue line is the ipaf and the red line is the ipf obviously the patients with ctd ild had a better prognosis now, if we divide the IPAF patients into UIP and non-UIP pattern, the patients with non-UIP pattern did equally well compared to CTDILD patients, which just shows us that we need to treat these patients with immunosuppression and identify them well. Now, in scleroderma ILD, if you look at uh, the survival, it is not so great. And, uh, Compared to 1970s, when the leading cause of death was renal crisis, in the last two decades, the cause of death more is pulmonary fibrosis. So we kind of have, you know, targeted uh, patients uh, who will develop uh, renal crisis and treated them well, but uh, the ILD front, uh, maybe we are not doing so well. So ILD has become a major you know, cause of death in these patients with scleroderma. Now, how do I treat these patients? Obviously, for these patients, uh, initially, pulse steroids are the uh, first line of treatment because they help us to give uh, you know, a, a good dose of immunosuppression. And then once we've given them pulse steroids, one gram, once daily for three to five days, we think about what is the induction agent. Now, the induction agent can be cyclophosphamide, mycophenolate, or rituximab. And then we think about maintenance with mycophenolate, in difficult cases, we can think about rituximab, IBIG, tacrolimab, stofacitinib, and then how do we monitor. So I'll take you through this. Now, the data for cyclophosphamide or mycophenolate in ILD comes from only scleroderma trial. So the scleroderma lung study one, which looked at uh, oral cyclophosphamide for a year, uh, and also the FAST trial, which looked at IV cyclophosphamide. They noticed that at the end of one year, there was improvement in the post vital capacity as well as the CT scan, and this was significant. However, when the medications were stopped, the FVC improvement was lost. The scleroderma lung study two, which looked at mycophenolate, again found that mycophenolate was not inferior to cyclophosphamide, and there was some improvement in the FVC at two years. And from then on, mycophenolate became the initial choice of treatment for patients with NSI. Now, rituximab in severe ILD. Uh, most of the you know, data that we have in rituximab are all from case series. So this is the earliest one where they looked at uh, 44 patients. Half of them had CTD ILD, half of them didn't have CTD ILD. And they gave rituximab two grams and followed up them five years. And uh, what they found was there was a significant reduction in, a reduction in the decline of FVC and DLCO in the CTD ILD group with rituximab. Uh, rituximab usage in antisynthetase syndrome is quite rewarding and uh, these patients do very well with rituximab. So in patients with progressively worsening ILD uh, with antisynthetase syndrome, we're given two doses of rituximab and noticed to have improvement in lung function, CT scan, and it was pretty well tolerated. Rituximab in scleroderma ILD, this is again from the uh, European uh, scleroderma registry or the USTAR, USTAR database where they have given around 63 patients uh, with uh, rituximab and they found that the decline in FVC was pre uh, prevented. Another small study will look at 14 patients with diffuse scleroderma and they found improvement in the FVC, the DLCO, as well as the skin thickening. So this is a promising treatment for our patients with uh, CTDI. Uh, fresh off the press is this uh, data from the Spanish registry last year which looked at the use of rituximab in rheumatoid arthritis. And so they had around 68 patients and they looked at these patients for 10 years uh, and they were looking at the decline in FPC by more than 5%, uh, you know, happened uh, in 42 patients. And they um, mentioned that if the decline was more than 5%, then that was worsening. And uh, what they found on multivariate analysis, again, just look at the last line, is that patients who were given rituximab um, the hazard ratio was only 0.51, so that's positive, and they did well. The other uh, features or the other points which, uh, you know, other pointers which pointed to a better prognosis was the use of steroids 
before the time of diagnosis of ILD NSIP pattern. And if the lag time to the ILD diagnosis was lesser, the survival was better, which obviously you're controlling the inflammation better. Again, comorbidity of emphysema and reflux also contributed to the IND. So we need to look at all these uh, additional parameters as well. Uh, this is one of my uh, you know, patients uh, with antisympathetic syndrome who presented uh, to me and the pulmonologist in 2015 with a uh, IND had uh, elevated CPK, JO1 antibody was positive and was treated initially with steroids, cyclophosphamide, then oral mycophenolate. And uh, then uh, uh, six months later was given rituximab because of flare of myositis and then has been doing quite well, uh, not requiring any further rituximab until November 2020. Uh, and he's uh, off oxygen uh, with good respiratory uh, reserve and uh, doing very well. Now, this is uh, the use of nintinelib in uh, CTD ILD. So this trial, census trial, which you are, most of you are avail, aware of, came last year, where they looked at uh, patients with uh, scleroderma ILD uh, and uh, gave them nintinanib uh, over a, a period and saw what was the improvement. So at the end of the trial, they found that there was a 52% you know, decline 52% uh, the rate of decline in the FPC was 52 you know percent uh, 44% sorry 44% less in patients with nitinanib so the relative redu risk uh, redu relative reduction of the decline of FPC was 44% in the nitinanib group the amount of FPC which uh, was different between the two was only 41 uh, so even though this number is a small number, but over a period of time, if we add up the uh, the difference in the FVC, then it might make a difference. The other uh, uh, you know point from this trial was that if you look at the patients who were only given uh, placebo, given placebo plus mycophenolate, nintinanib alone, and nintinanib plus MMF, the patient subgroup which received nintinanib with MMF had the maximum improvement in the decline in FSC. Now, this is better when we compare the patients with IPF who were given nintinanib. Uh, so definitely adding immunosuppression to nintinanib may give us a better treatment in patients with CTD ILD. Now, this has only been you know, studied in scleroderma ILD, but can be extrapolated to other uh, you know, CTD ILDs like rheumatoid, uh, needs to be seen. But this is one promising treatment option that we have. Now I'll just go through a few slides on each disease. So if there is a patient with rheumatoid arthritis in ILD who has rheumatoid factor CCP positive and has a UIP pattern of uh, ILD, which is most commonly seen, I would start off with uh, steroids, go with mycophenolate first. And if there is no appreciable difference, then think about Rituximab, especially in seropositive and smokers. Uh, think about cyclophosphamide if I want an early response. Uh, think about tocilizumab in seronegative and non-smokers. And if there is, uh, you know, UIP pattern, can think about using perfenidone as well. In patients with who have scleroderma or MCTD kind of features, where there is a nucleolar pattern of ANA and positive SCL70, again, initial treatment would be steroids and mycophenolate followed by if there is rapidly progressing IND, think about cyclophosphamide, uh, think about rituximab one gram at zero and two weeks, along with uh, mycophenolate, and this has been seen in, uh, you know, four trials, again, case studies which showed that there was improvement. Um, again, the new study showing that there may be some benefit with uh, nintinanib. And in patients with scleroderma, there might be some benefit in using tocilizumab as well in patients with ILD. Now, myositis associated ILD, this is uh, in clinical practice, one of the most responsive ILD to treatment. So initial treatment with steroids and mycophenolate, and then either jump to cyclophosphamide or rituximab depending on the response. Uh, usually now in my practice, I am using steroids with mycophenolate and tacrolimus combination because that will help to control the skin as well as the lungs and then go to rituximab if the patient is not responding. 
in patients who have anti mda5 disease rapidly associated ild then there are some case reports to suggest uh, improvement with uh, tofacitinib as well as ivh we should not forget the collateral damage so in these patients who have ild we are going to use steroids so we need to look at steroid induced diabetes hypertension we need to look at osteoporosis and above all look at gastroesophageal reflux disease some of these patients may develop pulmonary arterial hypertension they might be above the age of 50 post menopausal so there will be risk of cardiovascular disease they need nutritional support with uh, you know high protein diet and other uh, you know high calorie because their metabolic rate might be high they might be uh, you know losing weight uh, vitamin d calcium and not to forget home oxygen if they are hypoxic rehabilitation and breathing exercise and this era of covid vaccination including a covid vaccination so we have a multifaceted approach to the comprehensive supportive care of ild uh, in terms of uh, the relief of symptoms so how to improve dyspnea fatigue cough uh, which um, the pulmonology colleagues are better at how to use the disease modifying agents in terms of immunomodulation anti fibrotics um, immunomodulation probably we rheumatologists are better at then look at supportive care where the uh, you know support staff come into play uh, oxygen rehab exercises and eventually if the patient is not responding think about transplant and still if that's not a possibility then end of life care where uh, you know we need to look at uh, how the family can cope up with the uh, demise of the patient now what are the unmet needs in ild so timely diagnosis this was one of the most important uh, aspects there are a group of patients in whom we are not able to diagnose these patients early and each year each month in which the diagnosis delayed there is progression of ild so they have seen in patients with rheumatoid scleroderma that in a year's time if we don't treat them then up to 20 to 30% of patients may have a decline of uh, fvc by um uh, more than 10% now how do we monitor these diseases so we can do a 6 minute walk test we can do a pft every 6 months or a year uh repeat the ct scan of the chest every 2 years so we need to match these signs uh, with the cost of investigations and what treatment we are giving now combination therapy to tackle uh, ctd ild has still on the developing phase but definitely as rheumatologist we are getting better and uh, focusing on use of rituximab a little bit early in patients who deserve it now what improvements we can make in our approach uh, the most important thing is to work as a team so if the pulmonologist and the rheumatologist work as a team we can probably diagnose these patients back early and then offer them treatment early lung symptoms may be the first manifestation so we need to look at the underlying autoimmune disease we need to monitor these patients as i have told you earlier and uh, in patients who have progressive disease despite adequate immunomodulation we need to think about lung transplant so patients who are younger age group maybe 45 50 with the high inflammatory markers lower baseline fvc rapidly progressing ild may be good candidates for lung transplants and refer them to the centers so in summary if a patient is young uh, you know female gender nsip pattern ild we need to look at autoimmune disease if it is present and if one antibody is positive in a significant uh, tita there is a clinical feature like uh, either inflammation in the joints or muscles or rashes we should look for ctd ild now even though these tests for auto antibodies are expensive if you look at our advanced myositis profile which costs around close to 10 11000 but if we can get a diagnosis and give a treatment and reduce the mortality it's probably worth it so probably better you know best to evaluate the patient at one go in terms of history exam investigation get to a diagnosis and then offer treatment obviously management of these patients by the rheumatologist would be to focus on immunomodulation and uh, by the pulmonologist would be to see how well we can improve the lung function by medications by rehabilitation by exercises and obviously prevent further damage by giving vaccinations and preventing infections um that's all i have to talk today and thank you for your patient listening uh, and if there are any questions i'll be happy to answer them
Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Manish, for an uh, excellent presentation, wonderful uh, slides, which covers almost all practical uh, points, uh, which uh, generally faced by the pulmonologist during the diagnosis of uh, interstitial uh, lung disease. Not only uh, the diagnostic part, but the interesting thing, uh, thing is that you have uh, shown different pictures. They, they are very wonderful because uh, they are real-time pictures of the signs and symptoms which are associated with the uh, 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 rheumatic diseases. So uh, it is very easy for all of us to identify uh, this rheumatic conditions if it is associated with uh, lung diseases. Uh, if we minutely uh, examine the patients according to the pictures which we have shown, that is very, very uh, clear and very peculiar things. Uh, so uh, as we, are, we have seen uh, all of your slides. There are a lot of questions which has been generated in the minds of the audience and we are receiving uh, on my screen also. But before taking uh, all these questions, uh, I just want to ask one initial questions to you, Dr. Manish. Uh, suppose if we talk about the interstitial lung disease with the connective tissue disorders, generally we find that uh, it is more aggressive than the interstitial alone, ILD alone, if it is idiopathic. So if the patient come to us with the interstitial lung disease and there is a very rare symptoms or negligible symptoms uh, related to the interstitial lung disease, what we should do? Generally, we should uh, send all the investigations initially required as a serological part to make the confirmation whether it is associated with the uh, 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 CTD or we should wait till the symptoms appear. What do you suggest? Uh, excellent question, Dr. Agarwal. So um, I always believe that, uh, you know, if we delay the diagnosis or delay the treatment, the inflammation is not going to stop. So let's say a patient who has uh, asymptomatic uh, lung symptoms, but uh, because of the, you know, all widespread use of CT scan now in the clinical practice because of COVID, some, you know, ILD picture is picked up. Definitely in these patients, we need to uh, focus on the history of rheumatic diseases. So in terms of joint pains, rashes, inflammatory symptoms. And then at least, uh, you know, if the patient is of the female gender, we should definitely, uh, you know, do some basic investigations to evaluate for an underlying autoimmune disease. So at least a rheumatoid factor, uh, anti-nuclear antibody by immunofluorescence, uh, lung function test, which you obviously will do. And if needed, maybe an ANA profile and an anti-CCP if the other test comes. The, the reason I'm, which I'm stressing is that if we pick these patients up early, at least we can halt the disease progression at that stage itself, or maybe delay the progression. So, uh, 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 nice, uh, Dr. Manish, thank you very much. But uh, if, uh, suppose, we are suspecting the patient may have uh, interstitial lung disease along with the CTILD, but it is uh, there are no symptoms. So we can make it by the default that we should send the uh, these basic investigation, which is related to serology, serological investigations as a routine. By the default, we can send it, or we we should just wait. I just want to know from your so, side. Uh, in my personal experience, I I would suggest that we at least send the initial you know the investigations which I have mentioned because that this is one reason why the subgroup of IPAF was created. One was to, if we are looking at uh, trials to stratify these uh, you know, patients into one group, so that when we talk about undifferentiated connective tissue disorder, we talk about autoimmune flavored ILD, we might be talking about different patients. But if we talk about IPAF, we know that these patients have some morphological features of ILD on the CT, and they have one serological domain or one clinical domain. So these patients, as I have shown you in my slides, there is benefit in mortality when we treat them. So definitely these patients need to be evaluated the time that they present to you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Manish. Uh, suppose in association with my previous question, if uh, we think that, suppose the patient ha have interstitial lung disease with CTD, but there are very few symptoms uh, or it is in an indolent condition or in a refractory phase of uh, connective tissue disorder. Uh, what we should do in that phase, whether we should start if it is it has been diagnosed, suppose, for example, uh, ILD diagnosed uh, with the rheumatic uh, arthritis, but there was no symptoms or uh, th there may be some SLE features or 
uh, the serology which is positive for the same so whether we should start the therapy or what kind of therapy we can start if there are no symptoms at all related with the ctd only serology is positive so that's a question there are two types of treatment one is that we can observe the patient and see if they are going to develop some symptoms over time uh, occasionally the autoimmune test can be false positive as well even the ana can be false positive in up to 10% of population so if there are no uh, definite clinical signs different clinical uh, you know uh, features and the auto antibody test is borderline observation may be one way forward the other way forward is if the patient has some clinical features to suggest okay there is some ongoing inflammation high esr high crps some proteinuria something which is not you know normal in the test in those patients depending on the amount of inflammatory uh, load that the patient has so if the patient has minimal symptoms we might just get away by giving them little bit of low dose steroids hydroxychloroquine or maybe methotrexate but if the patient has more symptoms then we need to go to a higher dose of steroids and plus minus you know with uh, that mycophenolate so that has to be tailored and individualized uh, to the patient uh, symptoms and uh, investigation thank you dr uh, actually uh, if we talk about the management part of the ctild we found that there are a lot of medicines which are associated with the immunosuppression so the immunosuppression is a major factor uh, which may be associated with some complications and many times it is seen that if we start some immunosuppressive drugs there are some complication which may appear so what you suggest how to uh, treat them practically if and what kind of uh, uh, these uh, uh, complications appear during the course of the therapy or what is the precautions which we can take so that these complication will not appear actually uh, these are the practical things which uh, i think you may share with us and all of us sure sure so using immun immunosuppression is like a double edged sword we are trying to control the disease which is causing so much damage to the patient and in turn we might even harm the patient with the medications that we are doing so in my practice uh, what i am trying to do is number one is to make sure that the other diseases in terms of diabetes hypertension reflux osteoporosis at least somebody is looking after if i am not able to pay the attention so a physician is involved for diabetes hypertension uh, maybe uh, you know uh, the pulmonologist is involved for the vaccination to prevent uh, infections and i am involved with the uh, treatment of the immunomodulation the second thing what i do if you look at the medications you know the list of uh, methotrexate you look at mycophenolate you look at steroids and azathioprine i find the number one culprit uh, which causes more harm to the patient is steroid so in my practice i try to use as low dose of steroid as possible and try to taper it fast if that involves me using mycophenolate me involve you know using double immunosuppression in terms of combination of mycophenolate and methotrexate or mycophenolate and tacrolimus or mycophenolate and rituximab to reduce the steroid dose uh, i would go for that the third thing is to at least educate the patient to some extent as to okay if you are taking these medicines and you have symptoms uh, which are worsening or you have some new symptoms it is always better to tell us early rather than wait because if we intervene early the outcome is better and uh, you know lastly not to forget is to tell them how to take the immunosuppression so if it's mycophenolate it's empty stomach if it's methotrexate it's once a week occasionally they might be taking medications in uh, you know in a different way and that might cause problems okay good uh, uh, dr manish uh, actually a few questions uh, has appeared on my screen and i will take uh, one of the question uh, in continuation of this if uh, as you have uh, discussed about the uh, senescence trial senescence trial uh, which is associated with the anti fibrotic drugs nintedanib suppose uh, the drug nintedanib can be uh, add with other uh, immunosuppressive drugs so it may improve the condition uh, uh, this uh, ild conditions uh, as well as prognosis but if we talk about the prifanidone what is the role so the lotus study also has been conducted so which one is better uh, nintedanib or prifanidone because there is a huge difference in the rate of both the drugs so in in my personal experience uh, if you ask me the i might be wrong and you might be better judge at it but the amount of improvement in the lung symptoms which i have seen in my ctd ild patients with prifanidone have not been that dramatic 
So uh, the reason uh, may be that maybe they're not able to take that much amount of the dose, uh, but it helps in a small percentage of patients. The second point is uh, nintadanib is a new molecule for us, meaning until six months ago, the cost of nintadanib was even higher. And now maybe it's a little bit, uh, you know, less expensive. So nintadanib definitely is in our hands for a short time. We're still learning about the drug. But whatever limited, uh, you know, use that I have used in my clinical judgment, in my clinical practice, I definitely see that the molecule nintadanib to be a little bit better than uh, perfidinib. Perfidinib. The one question coming from uh, Kutuvalli, Dr. Uh, Prasanna Kumar, he's asking, uh, what is the role of inhaled steroid in ILDs? Is there any study or is there any experience? Or if we talk about CT ILD, is there any role of inhaled steroid? See, as far as I am aware of, there are no trials uh, which have been looked into it. Uh, the second thing is that the amount of inhaled steroids that we give uh, the dose is quite small uh, and uh, it's uh, as you know it's usually used for the airway disease so the amount of uh, steroid that we need to deliver through inhalation to treat ctd ilt would be quite huge uh, and it probably will cause more local damage in terms of candidiasis and you know other things um, but uh, i am not aware in rheumatology practice if inhaled steroids have been used to treat ctd ilt yeah, I think Dr. Manish, because uh, inhaled medications are, okay, if you talk about the steroids, inhaled steroid will not reach uh, uh, up to the uh, mark. Yes. Actually, it, it may uh, <coughs> stay in the trachea and major portion in the large bronchi and small bronchi. So this may be the reason also, and this quantity is small. That is another factor which is uh, important. So uh, no guidelines has been recommended this inhaled steroid, but this question has been asked. So it is very good question. Along with that, the one, another question which has been, I think, asked by the gynecologist, Sangeeta Priya, she's asking uh, whether CTD, CTD in pregnancy uh, and what is the role of immunosuppressant, whether it can be given or not. If the pregnancy is there and the patient have this uh, CTD along with the ILD, what we should do actually? Whether we should do it till the delivery or we can add something. So in pregnancy and CTD, that's another topic as well. But there are a class of drugs which are useful and safe. So a use of steroids of less than 20 milligrams per day, uh, hydroxychloroquine, azathioprine, uh, tacrolimus. These four agents uh, and if there is uh, joint symptoms, sulfasalazine. These five uh, agents are absolutely safe in pregnancy, even the first, second and third trimester. And general rule of the thumb is to plan pregnancy once the CTD is well controlled, because uh, almost 60, 70, 80 percent of them will flare uh, if the disease is not controlled during pregnancy. So the rule is to control the CTD first uh, with the available immunosuppression and then stop mycophenolate, methotrexate, rituximab few months, at least three to six months before switch to agents which are safer and then you know plan for pregnancy and print. Thank you, Dr. Manish. There are a lot of questions which has been asked by the audience. So it is flooded with my uh, screen. I just are uh, taking few interesting questions. Uh, uh, it has been asked from the Banaras, uh, Dr. Rashid. He uh, he's asking duration of steroid and immun uh, immunosuppressant therapy in CT and ILD. That's a very important question. Uh, how uh, long we can continue all these medicines because there are uh, trials which are giving the idea about the 52 weeks or we can say 72, uh, 72 weeks but not beyond it what is the expectation whether we should give it throughout the life because it has been diagnosed before the 50 years so what is the life expectancy and how long we can provide these medications this is very interesting and uh, important question so uh, there are two three questions in it so i'll take one at a time in patients who have an autoimmune disease and they are untreated, uh, studies have shown that they will die a decade earlier. So if the life expectancy of Indian citizens is around 65 years, if somebody develops CTD or LD or you know, connective tissue disorder, rheumatoid, and they're not treated, most likelihood that they will die by mid-50s, 10 years early. So the second question is that how long to treat? The, the simple answer is that this is an autoimmune disease which is not going to get cured. So the treatment is going to be lifelong. Now, I'm not saying that they have to take steroids lifelong, they have to take uh, immunosuppression lifelong, but what we have seen in our rheumatology practice and rheumatology journals is that 
over a period of time, after some time, in some patients, maybe 40-50% of patients, we are able to reduce the amount of medicines that they are taking after a period of 3-5 to five years. But if you look at patients who have vasculitis, who have lupus, uh, you know, these are difficult diseases. The moment we reduce the medicines within few years, they relapse again. So the, the rule is to keep them on the least amount of medicines which can control the disease and monitor them from for flare. So in lupus, we will look at complements, double standard DNA, protein urea, clinical exam. In vasculitis, we might look at renal loss, ANCA. In rheumatoid, we look at CRP, ESR. So based on these things, we can fine tune the treatment. But some immunosuppression, some medicine is going to be lifelong like diabetes, hypertension, and hypothyroidism. So we can we can continue it till the disease exists. So that is uh, very important actually to seize the disease pattern. Although studies is limited for a few uh, months or uh, years, but it doesn't mean that it will be it will uh, stop at that moment when the study has been ended. So uh, another interesting question which has been raised by the JC uh, in this COVID era. So actually, uh, if the person who is interested for the vaccination and is on immunosuppressive therapy and having this disease, what precautions we can take? Whether we should stop the immunosuppressants or we should take uh, stop, uh, we should stop it two to three days, or more duration is required to uh, control this immunosuppression before the vaccination. What are the guidelines which you want to share? Sure. sure. So this uh, exact question has been answered by the American College of Rheumatology and they have listed a guideline where they have mentioned that uh, the dose of steroid should be less than 20 milligrams at the time of vaccination. So if the dose of steroids is more than 20 milligrams, it is better to defer the COVID vaccination till we reduce the steroids. A second thing is out of all the immunosuppressive tablets that we use, only methotrexate which is uh, you know, uh, used in rheumatoid, has to be stopped one week before and one week after the COVID vaccination. So after, because uh, you know, for each vaccine dose, one week before, one week after. So they're taking it once a week. So one week before, miss one dose. One week later, miss one dose. Other medications like uh, mycophenolate, azathioprine, tacrolimus, you know, they can be continued. Hydroxychloroquine, they can be continued. Now, when we come to biologics, uh, we now have jack inhibitors, oral molecules, uh, tofacitinib. That has to be stopped for one week after the vaccine. And uh, rituximab, that's the most uh, you know, troublesome because when we give anti-CD20 uh, you know, rituximab, the effect is for six months. So there the recommendation is to give the vaccine at the lag end or the fag end of the rituximab dose. So if we are giving it every six months, if we give the vaccine at around the fifth month or the sixth month when the dose is due, complete the two doses and after the second dose, give rituximab after four weeks. So, uh, so rituximab usage is a little bit difficult, but the other molecules, it's only one week, two weeks that we need to stop. Okay, so so there is no absolute contraindication. So uh, we can go for vaccination those who are under treatment. This is yes. uh, as per the government guidelines, they can be vaccinated and the medications need to be a little bit fine. Only a few precautions which we can, uh, we can take. Yeah, Dr. Manish, uh, another uh, query which raised in my mind, I just, uh, I will take a few questions more after this. If we talk about the pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary ID hypertension, which is associated uh, with this uh, CT ID frequently, uh, which it, it increased the morbidity as well as mortality in this uh, combination. So what do you suggest whether uh, or, uh can be started initially uh, when this uh, pulmonary hypertension just appear or we can give it in, along with all these uh, immunosuppressant drugs because few uh, literatures or the paper says uh, this Bosidan have some effect on CTILD also. So what do you suggest whether it, it should be started at uh, a starting of PAH or we can start it initially when we give the regime? Okay. So in patients with the scleroderma, in patients with mixed connective tissue disorder and as well as dermatomyositis, the chances of pulmonary arterial hypertension are more. And I usually order an echo at the first visit itself because some of them may be asymptomatic and the shortness of breath that they are complaining of can be contributed by both ILD as well as PH. Now, if I detect PH, where the right heart pressures are elevated, uh, you know, uh, on the echocardiogram, uh, then based on that, if there is a CTD ILD, I would start treatment. 
so my general you know rule of the thumb in the clinic is to start them if the you know ph pressures are high like 70 or 80 mm would be to start them on combination therapy of tadalafil with amrisentin or tadalafil with vosentin Uh, the good thing about uh, PAH associated with CTD ILD is that after six months, twelve months, when you repeat the echo, you will see that the PAH has resolved to a great extent or has improved. So this immunosuppression not only improves the ILD but also improves the PAH as well. So at that time, maybe we can scale down the medicines. But uh, the recommendation is to start the you know combination therapy uh, like what we do in other uh, autoimmune diseases. Go with combination therapy. hit hard treat early and then scale down obviously this leads to multiple medications more pills uh, but at the end of the day treat 6 months we are able to come down on medications yeah but uh, there is no need to continue this bosit on for a life long along with uh, no. other medications there is no. no need i think no so there are a good percentage of patients in whom i have been able to stop these medications and then we do an echo once a year we monitor them occasionally when the disease flares okay they have may get a relapse but uh, a lot of them once they are on immunosuppression even the ph uh, reverses but it's not a universal rule but maybe you know 30 40% of them yes yes yeah yeah dr manish uh, dr kashmiri uh, from sonipat is asking whether uh, what is the frequency of investigations if we put the patient on the immunosuppression drugs what is the frequency of the investigation like kft lft and ch at which frequency we should go for these investigations in the so initially at least for the first 3 months we need to monitor the complete blood picture the creatinine the liver function test and the blood sugars at least once a month for the first 3 months and after that if the patient is stable we can do it once in 3 months uh, for the next uh, subsequent 2 years so one uh, one of our audience is uh, asking which one is better uh, uh, i think uh, he's saying ki whether uh, we should give rotuximab or infliximab which one is better rotuximab or infliximab so which have the least side effect uh, both of them are different molecules they have their own problems but in ctd ild the drug which has been proven to be of benefit is rituximab the beauty of rituximab is that the dose is 1 gram today 1 gram 2 weeks later and that works for a minimum of at least 6 months uh, even up to you know few years in a in a small, small subset of patients infliximab is usually used for patients with uh, rheumatoid arthritis uh, with uh, ankylosing spondylitis or psoriatic Uh, in if you ask me in patients who have ild associated with ra they are usually zero positive and rituximab is a better option for them and uh, one point i would just like to add is if i am giving rituximab for ild a large group of my patients who had myositis ild dermatomyositis ild ra ild i have only given them two doses of rituximab in the beginning and after that for few years like the patient that i presented for 4 5 years they don't read rituximab they are just on low dose steroids mycophenolate some other molecules and they are doing well so somehow rituximab has a very good positive effect effect on the ild but for patients with lupus for vasculitis or rashes i have to keep giving it every 6 months or one year but for ild rituximab works best that is very good experience which you have shared with our audience so in a nutshell we can say rituximab is best uh as a biologic therapy better, better, if, if it is required to uh, uh use beyond the immunosuppressants so another question if uh, stem cell therapy is required suppose uh, the disease goes beyond the limit and there is uh, the Im- we have given the immunosuppressants as well as biologics and it is not working yet is there any role of uh, stem cell therapy uh in CTILD or is there any uh, thing which is in pipeline okay so stem cell therapy uh, autologous stem cell therapy has been tried in patients with scleroderma uh, that was a small study of maybe 14 15 patients and uh, that study also included patients who had ILD uh, initially they were doing uh, uh, the initial trials which were done the problem was the risk of mortality because we are going to give uh, high dose uh, cyclophosphamide and other myeloablative treatment in which the mortality rate was very high but in autologous uh, non myeloablative stem cell transplant uh, 
uh, there was some promising results and there was some improvement in the FPC and the lung function as well. Uh, but however, this treatment has not been taken up on a large scale. Uh, the numbers uh, that have been done have only been from research centers and few centers in the US. But obviously, it is one option. Uh, honestly, I have never used this option in any of my patients. Uh, one, because either they are too sick to go for it. Second is the cost. But it would be an option which would be available in future once we get better. And the uh, regimen become non-myeloablative, which is less toxic to the body. Uh, in continuation uh, of this, my previous question, I just want to ask this advancement of uh, therapies, whether uh, any role of lung transplant, because it is very lucrative technique nowadays and uh, people uh, people goes in that direction. If the lung uh, is completely fibrosed and there is uh, no effect of all uh, the pharmacological management, so we may go for lung transplant. And if it is so, then what is the prognosis later? So, uh, uh, if you look at uh, lung transplant as an option, that is a very uh, good option. And even in Hyderabad and other cities in the India, the lung transplant centers are picking up. And I have mentioned in my slides as well, any patient who has a rapidly progressive ILD, not responsive to treatment, becoming high oxygen dependent, you know, lower age group of 45, 50 is an ideal candidate for it. Uh, usually after post-transplant, they will be on immunosuppression, mycophenolate, uh, you know, steroids and other things. Uh, now, I don't know if what is going to happen to the transplanted lung after two to three years. Uh, is the transplant lung going to develop ILD? That data I'm not aware of. But if you look at the patients who had end-stage renal disease, had kidney transplant because of lupus and because of vasculitis, there was a small risk where the disease can come back in the transplanted kidney as well. So the same risk will be there in the transplanted lung as well, but I am not aware of the exact numbers. But this is a definitely a, a much more promising treatment compared to stem cell transplant, which is coming. So I think a newer modality, if we don't have some, uh, if we don't have medicine in our hands, so we should seek the... <laughs> Uh, blessings of our surgeons, especially the cardiothoracic surgeons, for the betterment or the increase the expectancy of the life. I think it will be a better option later. It becomes the science is growing day by day. Uh, another question which I will take from the audience side that is very very uh, important question also. But uh, uh, Dr. Rashid Parvez from Varanasi uh, is asking that whether we can give the PCP profile access and CTI can be can we use it? PCP profile exists. Yeah. So uh, uh, for patients who are uh, getting pulse cyclophosphamide uh, once a month, one gram, in those patients for six months, I am giving them, uh, you know, Bactrim double strength tablet uh, thrice a week for six months. Uh, but in patients who are on usual immunosuppression with steroids, mycophenolate, or who have uh, taken rituximab, I am not using it. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Manish. Uh, the audience uh, queries will not stop, but I just want to ask in in, in between. Uh, I just want to ask one uh, my own query that whether we can go for a cryo biopsy uh, in cases of CTILD or vets assisted biopsy. Uh, is there any harm or is there any precautions which we uh, which we may, uh, we can take when uh, we are doing that procedures to make a definitive diagnosis of it? Okay, sure, sure. So the the advent of the newer antibodies which are available to us have simplified our diagnostic skills because if the patient has some clinical features to suggest a CTD, uh, has some positive antibodies, has some features on the CT scan suggestive of ILD, then the diagnosis is very clear and we don't need to go for a lung biopsy or a cryobiopsy. The role of lung biopsy, cryobiopsy comes when we are in a dilemma. Is the diagnosis correct? Is there an element of infection? Is there an element of hypersensitivity, pneumonitis, which is there? In those patients, maybe, yes, cryo-lung biopsy would be good, where we have done the evaluation, all autoantibodies are negative, patient does not have you know, autoimmune symptoms. In those patients, yes. And in these patients, maybe doing a PET CT, uh, getting the area where there is uptake in the lung and then going for cryo-lung biopsy from that area would give us more diagnostic yield, in my uh, opinion. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Manish. I think all the queries has been quenched. Uh, that is a very great thing that you are with us. A great personality, a knowledgeable person who gives the answer uh, for all the queries. And uh, I think we should close this uh, question answering session at this point because there is no other questions left, actually, we can say. So uh, thank you very much, Dr. Manish. Thank you, sir. Thank you.